You are listening to part two of European Commercial Agriculture, a podcast created by the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. Our mission is to help you understand your world better through geography. Part one described European regional agricultural patterns. Part two will illustrate how politics has influenced and continues to influence European farming patterns. This podcast addresses two Minnesota geography standards for grades 9 through 12. Our presenter is Dr. David Lanergan, professor of geography at McAllister College in St. Paul and director of the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. I am Fred Kunze, a member of the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. And now, here is Dr. Lanergan. Now, in all uh, contemporary agriculture, uh, government plays a, a major role in uh, making sure food is safe and controlling what goes on in the fields in terms of pesticides and fertilizers and so on. Uh, but in Germany, uh, it's a little different because the European community creates a set of rules that uh, have uh, complicated goals and to somewhat contradictory goals. So the, the goal is to keep the farmer's income high, but keeping the market prices for food low enough to avoid consumer protests. So the, each year the quotas are set and there's a quite a lot of discussion among politicians rather than among farmers about what should be grown. After World War II, Germany was divided into two parts, and the eastern part uh, was set up under a communistic form of government, and there the farms, these former small village farms and these estates, were collectivized, and they uh, were organized into so-called production collectives, and there are about 5,000 of these large-scale collective farms which were run by the government. So the land was taken from the private owners, taken over by the state, and then assigned to these state farms or, or collectives. And these uh, farms were very large. They had about 4,000 hectares, so maybe 8,000 American acres under, on average under cons uh, cultivation in each of these units. Now, Germany is now unified, and it's all now under a capitalist form of agriculture. And it's interesting to see that about three-fourths of the, these large collective farms have remained uh, intact and are now operated as cooperative farms or partnerships among the farmers, or some are actually even totally private uh, corporate farms. The others have been returned to their original owners, so there's been an actual increase in the number of farms in eastern Germany. So it's gone from, under the communists, a little over 5,000 units uh, to now, under the capitalists, with somewhere around 14,000 private farms. In western Germany, uh, the situation is very similar. Um, family farms predominate. Uh, now it's interesting to note that in total in Germany there's about uh, 630,000 farms and there are about 750 full-time employees on these farms. So obviously there are a lot of part-time employees and most farms are uh, run by individuals who have jobs off the farm as well. So they, its farming is not a full-time operation for many of the agriculturalists in Germany. Now the flat terrain of northern Germany, the so-called North European Plain, or sometimes called the North German Plain, uh, and the, in the eastern portions are particularly suitable for growing grain and sugar beets. So rye and oats and wheat are grown in these areas. Where the terrain is more hilly or mountainous, farmers shift and produce vegetables, uh, dairy products, and animals, uh, hogs and cattle, or pork and beef. 
And all the large cities are surrounded by uh, fruit farms and vegetable farms that produce fresh food for the, the city. The uh, Rhine Valley and the Western Valleys of Germany are famous for uh, producing grapes to be produced into, into uh, wine. Here you see uh, an area called the Kaiserstuhl, or the emperor's seat, uh, heavily modified, terraced over the years uh, to produce a high-quality uh, grape. You can see in the mid-foreground uh, the red roofs of the little village. Uh, the agricultural village that uh, controls this part of the area. Again, you can see in this photograph the, how the village and agricultural land butt right up against each other, and you can see how the, over the years the Germans have terraced these hillsides uh, to maximize the exposure to, of the crops to the sun uh, to ensure that they get a, a high-quality grape. Here where you can see the valley of the Rhine uh, from a Rhine boat, uh, and again you can see how the sides of the valley are totally cultivated uh, with the highway and railroad track running uh, along the shore. Now interestingly, uh, because of the ability of the Germans and others to produce uh, bumper crops, uh, the European uh, Union has uh, mandated that there be caps on uh, great production. And here you see, again, along the Rhine, uh, in the mid-foreground there, uh, terraced fields that formerly were great uh, vineyards but have been abandoned uh, to, uh, main, to, to keep the landscape under the quota. Northern Europe, uh, as you can see in the map, has very little agriculture. Uh, the rapid urbanization of the Scandinavian Peninsula uh, really made it uh, uneconomical to stay in the poor soils, the stony soils and the inhospitable climate. So most of those farms in Scandinavia have reverted to tree farms and the um, population moved to industrial jobs in the city. Uh, once the lands of uh, the Ukraine became uh, under cultivation, uh, the Swedish farmers could not sell their grain uh, at a low enough price uh, in the world market, and they were basically forced out of existence. If you look at uh, Scotland, the same sort of thing, uh, a retreat of agriculture and a shift over to herding uh, sheep and cattle, and the same with Ireland. Denmark, a very productive agricultural region, in fact, one of the most successful agricultural economies of the modern uh, world. Here you see uh, a landscape uh, in the foreground, a, an ex-urban house person who is engaged in what we might call quasi-agriculture, a very small scale, uh, and per, uh, living on money from other low sources. And then in the yellow field is the neighboring farm. Uh, this is a field of canola, and then you can see the, the Baltic in the background. Mediterranean agriculture is very different. It's uh, focused on uh, the production of uh, vegetables, uh, citrus fruits, uh, and uh, wheat. It's, of course, we're, we know a lot about this agriculture because it's the agriculture behind uh, the Mediterranean diet, the Italian, Greek, and Spanish cuisines, uh, which are so popular in the United States. Uh, but here, there were very few herd animals. Draft animals were small, donkeys and oxen, and uh, flocks were moved from the lower elevations to the upper elevations during the summer to take advantage of the grass on the higher mountains, and then uh, the herbs were brought back uh, down the slopes in the, sum, in the fall uh, to winter over in the lower areas. And while they were up in the uplands, uh, they were milked, of course, and, and cheeses were made. So cheese is a part of the Mediterranean diet, as are uh, these grains and fruits and vegetables and also fish. You have been listening to a production of the Minnesota Alliance for Geographic Education. Background music is courtesy of Jim Hogue of Decorah, Iowa. 
The Minnesota Alliance is a nonprofit group of educators and other parties who are interested in promoting an enhanced understanding of our world through improved geographic literacy.